legen wir los, oder? Was haben Sie da gehabt? Good morning, good morning and welcome everybody to day three of our conference. Um, it is my pleasure to do the moderation for this morning session. Um, my name is Eric Aschenbrand. I am professor at uh, Eberswald University at our Biosphere Reserves Institute. Um, we have two days of, um, two days of conference um, two very intense days, I have to say, of conference um, uh, already behind us, right, with uh, early career scientists discussing on uh, research in, for, and with Biosphere Reserves presenting their topics. And I have to say, it is such a pleasure, actually, it is such a pleasure to get in touch with all of you, to meet so many people that so far have met maybe only online, maybe not at all, maybe just once, and now to meet again and to, um, to exchange, it is, it is just great and, and a huge pleasure. Um, I want to um, introduce you, or to, to you know, to um, tell you a little bit what we are um, up to today. And therefore, I would like to ask the tech support to show that first slide and scroll down a little bit. Um, thank you even further down. So we had a lot of presentations already and workshops, and we will have more of it even down, please. Um, a little bit further down, because this is what we want to see. Thank you. Um, so this conference is divided in two parts, actually, as all of you will have heard by now. So we have two days of early career scientists presenting their research and their results and um, also discussing, discussing their ideas of how to develop research in biosphere reserves. And um, today we are in the middle. Today we have our excursion day. So we will have a session in the morning um, and then we will go on excursions, exploring the Biosphere Reserve that we are actually into here today. We are in Biosphere Reserve Shorefi de Corine, and um, we will explore this Biosphere Reserve today with our excursions. And, um, and then we will have the conference of the research managers who have arrived yesterday, who have arrived the day before yesterday, and we want to discuss. And what we want to do is we want to integrate both perspectives. Um, and today is where we want to do that. So we will start now first with a discussion by um, uh, Alicia uh, Baraklov, which will be in discussion with Martin Price and Maureen Reed on the history of the MAP program and on the learnings that we can take away from that. And after that point, we want um, our, we ask our rapporteurs, because in the first session, in the first two days of conference, all the talks were summarized by our rapporteurs and we want them, we ask them to the stage later to discuss um, their findings because our aim is to transfer the ideas of the first part of the conference to the second group, to the research managers and to bring both groups into discussion. And this is what we want to do today really and this is also what the excursion should, you know, encourage. So we want you to, you know, we want to use the whole day to go, to get into discussion, to, to discuss what we, um, our ideas actually for improving research, for further developing research in and for biosphere reserves. Um, let, us, um, let us start. Um, I, will, um, I will, well, the, the steps that we will make, we will, I will uh, introduce to, to you a little bit what we are up to, but first I want to um, ask uh, Alicia, Maureen and Martin to the floor for the discussion on um, the history and the learnings from, um, well, and future learnings that we can take from the history on research in biosphere reserves. Please. Yes. And could the tech support please change the presentation, show the next presentation? Take a second. 
All right, great. <laughs> so, good morning, everyone. I hope you're feeling fresh <laughs> this morning. Um, so, I think I just want to start by saying that uh, for those of you who weren't there, we started the week, um, and one of the inquiries that was presented at our plenary on Monday was how to learn from the past and how to um, incorporate our kind of experiences going forward and doing that in an intergenerational way. So, I'm very happy to be here with Maureen and Martin. Um, <clears throat> And I think, <clears throat> so I think um, many of us who've done research in biosphere reserves have heard this expression um, from a science program to a sites um, program. And I think, Martin, you advocated for this conference because you wanted to <clears throat> um, give, you know, renew the focus on science and research in, in the World Network and in the MAP program. So I'm kind of you know, wondering if you can take us back 50 years and tell us how it all started and what the first vision of, of the MAP program was. Ah, but okay, uh, yes, yeah. well, no, yeah, I can yeah. do. So just to start with, uh, why is it Maureen and me here? Uh, because there are many other people in the room who could be doing the same presentation uh, or discussion. Um, but I think part of the reason we are here is we, we were the editors of a book uh, uh, which was published in 2019. And some of the authors also are here, and I should thank them for being involved in it. So, but what we hope, we don't want to write volume two. We hope that volume two will be written by the next generation of researchers and practitioners, uh, probably someone who is already in the room. So, now to answer Alicia's question. <laughs> so, yes, you asked... I, you said, yes, I've been advocating for this conference because I wanted to introduce a renewed... Oops, it's not working. That's working. That's better. Yes. I hear a little echo, too. But I should say, yes, I, I really felt that this conference would be important, but it's not just me, and it's in the Lima Action Plan. So we are actually moving towards the implementation of the Action Plan with this conference. But then looking back, 50 years ago... I was not involved 50 years ago. Uh, some people were. I got involved uh, uh, as a doctoral student in the mid-80s. But since the very beginning, MAB has been an intergovernmental science program. And at the beginning, it had these three aims you can see on the slide. And MAB, at the beginning, was organized around what were called project areas, thematic project areas, 14 of them, some related to particular environments like mountains, different types of forests or islands, some of them related to interactions between people and their environments, like the impacts of agrochemicals and pollution, major engineering product, uh, projects, urban areas. It was a very wide-ranging program. And within each of these project areas, there were field projects in different places around the world on, with the research on the themes identified for each of these project areas. Especially in developing countries, it wasn't just about research, training and capacity building were very important parts. And just to give an idea of the scale of the program, in late 1982, so just after 10 years after the beginning, there were 1,030 field research projects associating over 10,000 researchers in 79 countries. Those are pretty sizable numbers. Um, and maybe we can think about that this can be a goal, maybe not those specific goals we talked about indicators, but that in the future there should be similar numbers of research projects in biosphere reserves that are coordinated, because that's what we're talking about. Anyway, so some of these projects were within single disciplines, some were multi or interdisciplinary, some were truly innovative at the cutting and edge of science. And this was the kind of idea uh, of MAB at the beginning, um, to understand conservation practice with humanity rather than uh, research removing people from ecosystems. And this is a poster from, from 1981. Yeah. And so within all of these kind of thematic areas and you know, these goals, what, what role did biosphere reserves actually play? Well, this is a really interesting question um, because at the beginning, Biosphere reserves emerged as a set of representative ecosystems to be established as research sites, monitoring, education, and training across all the different project areas. 
They came mainly out of a particular project area with the title, long title, Conservation of Natural Resources and of the Genetic Material They Contain, in other words, Biodiversity Conservation. But if you listen to those words, Conservation of Natural Resources, that's very much about conservation, and that's really what biosphere reserves were about uh, well into the 1990s. Um, although the first biosphere reserves were designated in 1976. And what's interesting is that if you look at biosphere reserves and the sites where the project's research was done in those 14 project areas, they weren't the same. The, the, uh, the biosphere reserves were the kind of the favorite research sites of scientists involved in national committees, and they got them on the list, and I talked to Peter Bridgewater about this earlier. The work that was done, those thousand projects or so, they were not basically done in biosphere reserves. They were done in other places. So they were not, biosphere reserves and research weren't really very well connected in the main structure of the program. So whether that was true globally, I'm not quite sure, but it certainly seems from everyone I've talked to, they, they say, yes, that was the thing, a mismatch between biosphere reserves were not the places where the main research was done. And, and I know that you worked on a mountain project, and I think you're quite famous for your work in mountains. So I don't know if you want to use that as an example to tell us a bit more about how it all um, unfolded. Oops, that was the last slide, sorry. I forgot to click. So, yes, that's, that's Biosphere Reserve. So, yeah, mountains. So, yes, mountain project areas where I started my, my career in MAB. Uh, it was one of the first to be designed, and... Working groups met in 1973 and agreed on three main focuses on in temperate mountains, tropical mountains, and high latitude mountains. And they also talked about a need for comparative worldwide research. And by 1981, there were 85 activities in 31 countries. In the temperate mountains, which we're looking at here, the Alps were a major focus. There were large nationally funded projects in Austria, France, Germany, and Switzerland, which took place in sequence, and so people in one country learned from what had happened in the other countries, and it sort of developed with knowledge and models uh, evolving over time. There were some projects in other European mountain ranges, in the temperate mountains, also in Australia, New Zealand, and the Rocky Mountains of Colorado. And I put this picture up because that's the only one in Colorado where it was actually a biosphere reserve was involved. It also happens to be where I did my doctorate. Um, <laughs> one of the other major outcomes was the establishment of the first interdisciplinary mountain science journal, Mountain Research and Development, again in Colorado, which is still published and is a key legacy of the MAB program. And in tropical mountains, uh, there were projects in the mountains of 16 countries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. And some of the key outcomes were the first state of knowledge reports on Andean ecosystems, the first conference on African mountains, which you can see here, published in Mountain Research and Development, and the establishment of the International Center for Integrated Mountain Development, or ISIMOD, in Kathmandu. Uh, that still exists, and it's a really important uh, institution because if you think about the Himalayas and the countries of the Himalayas, some of them don't get on very well with each other. But if you go to Kathmandu, to Isimod, you find people from China, India, Pakistan, all working together. So it's a really great legacy of the MAB program. So overall, the mountain project area, and I'm just using this as an example, there were 13 other project areas, was a huge catalyst not just for research in mountains, but for knowledge exchange, training, and many meetings. Um, since then, the mountain activities have been uh, more limited, and there has been ongoing research in the mountains of uh, some uh, countries. Um, but just to mention that uh, really the, the whole big project areas really stopped running really pretty much in the 1990s. So just to continue the mountain theme, since you asked, um, uh, in the 2000s, there were a couple of projects on global change in mountain biosphere reserves. So then, now the focus was on biosphere reserves in, in mountains. Uh, the first was funded by the European Commission and involved uh, people from 26 biosphere reserves on, in, and 40, 140 people. Um, and that led to a research strategy uh, for global change in mountain areas, not just biosphere reserves. 
Um, and that was followed by a, a smaller project um, which uh, was funded by the MAB Secretariat. And basically after that in about, well, 15 years ago, that was the end of coordinated research in mountain areas. But the good news is the one over on the right that we now very recently, last week, had the first meeting of a new network uh, on a global network of mountain biosphere reserves um, with a joint secretariat in Spain and China, which is a really interesting idea. Uh, and just to say that about two thirds of the biosphere reserves in the world are in mountains. So it's pretty obvious it would be logical to have a mountain biosphere reserve network. So it kind of sounds like a lot of these thematic, uh, you know, areas and coordinated research kind of slowly faded or fell away in the 90s. And I'm, I'm kind of wondering why you think that happened and if you have any kind of explanation for it. Well, I've been thinking about that and um, other people in the room may have other uh, thoughts, but my feelings are, are the following. I think, why did the thematic networks disappear? Well, one thing is I think scientists like to move on to new projects. National and European funding agencies rarely provide more than a few years of funding. MAB was the flavor of the, we can say the decade in the 70s and into the 80s, but it was no longer the flavor of the decade once we got into the 90s. Uh, so it, it was still there, it was still an intergovernmental science program, but I think the, the interest of the scientists, many of the scientists, and the interest in the funding agencies, because remember it was all nationally funded, UNESCO wasn't funding it, it was, UNESCO was providing the umbrella, that run out. Also, what was happening, the new flavors of the month were those of you, us who were around, there was the IGP, IGBP, the International Geosphere Biosphere Program, and the International Human Dimensions Program. Um, so there were these big global change research programs starting up in the late 80s. And of course, some of the people who were in MAB got involved with those. But they kind of, they didn't keep the MAB involvement. And although these new structures like IGBP and IHDP recognize the need for a global set of research sites and the concept of biosphere reserves have become more interdisciplinary, the reality on the ground of most biosphere reserves is that they were still only or mainly conservation sites. So it wasn't very easy to sell them as a global network of research sites. So they kind of were there, but people were not really able to, to focus on them. And it wasn't until in 1996 uh, mm -hmm. at the Civil Conference we had the statutory framework for the World Network of Biosphere Reserves that this gradual evolution of sites to be, quote, truly sites of excellence to explore and demonstrate approaches to conservation and development on a regional scale began. So as the number of biosphere reserves they became more and more the focus of the MAB program as they are today, rather than internationally coordinated science. There was some international knowledge exchange, but Noelene is at the front and she will nod when I say this, this is often severely hampered by shrinking budgets and decreasing numbers of staff in the MAB secretariat. So there were some challenges, um, but we are rising above the challenges again. And uh, that was my last, uh, slide so back now to Alicia <laughs> so thanks thanks Martin and I think a lot of the challenges that you've outlined I, become quite familiar to many of us in this room and I think we discussed many of them yesterday right so and I think like the, the 90s is really this time of the just after the Brundtland report and our common future and sustainable development really takes the global stage so I'm, I'm kind of wondering how that affected the MAB program Maureen yeah absolutely so I think it in the 1990s, there were kind of two key shifts, and one of them is that shift towards sustainable development. So in 1987, the Brundtland Report came out, and as um, Martin pointed out, in the mid-1990s, there was um, a UNESCO conference or a MAB conference that then turned um, or added sustainable development as one of the now three functions of biosphere reserves. And so, Biosphere reserves started to become promoted as these model regions for sustainable development. And you can see on the photo on the very right, the atlas of, it's the atlas of um, uh, the World Biosphere Reserve at Manakawagan Uapishka in 
uh, northern British Columbia, or northern Quebec, which is one example of that. And uh, so at that time, sci or politicians were really scrambling to become um, the politician who was leading sustainable development. So very conservative politicians, Margaret Thatcher in the UK, um, Brian Mulroney, who was the uh, leader of a conservative government in Canada, all wanted to become the leaders of sustainable development. And frankly, I don't think sites for research were that sexy. As Martin says, they were you know, not quite the flavor of the decade. And so really, um, sites for sustainability seem to be much more compelling. And I think that that framing also reinforced the kind of sites um, image that Alicia pointed out at the beginning as well. Um, and I think the other, the second, um, sort of the second influence is the introduction of sustainability science. And this comes a little bit later, but nonetheless is really important. And so I put on the slide here the text of, uh, from the Biosphere Conference in 1968 and the MAB strategy in 2015. And you can see by the colors in the text some of the changes in the phrasing. So at the Biosphere Conference, we spoke about modern science. But at the uh, MAB strategy, modern science becomes an integrated problem-solving approach. In 68, we talked about rational methods and in 2015, we talked about bringing together the full range of scientific, traditional, and indigenous knowledge. And then in 68, we talked about use and conservation, bringing use and conservation together. But by 2015, we were talking about multiple challenges associated with sustainable development. And so I think the second influence of sustainability science was also important. And, and what do you think that this kind of new development of this sustainability science concept did for research and for research in BRs as well? Ah. <laughs> well, that's a good question. So we start to see research with and by biosphere reserves, not just research in them and not just research on biosphere reserves. And uh, I think that the focus of this kind of research was quite different, right? It, focused on a variety of topics that I've heard in the first two days of this conference. So adaptive and collaborative governance, social ecological systems, capacity building and social learning to enhance management effectiveness, for example, and new narratives of conservation stewardship. I think all of these themes were presented in the first couple of days here. But also really important is that research wasn't simply being done by scientists. It was also being done with local managers, practitioners, um, and communities to address the challenges that they were identifying, not just the challenges that scientists were identifying. And this was a shift in how we produce knowledge. So the idea of knowledge co-production became important. Um, and I think these ideas also brought, drew in more of the social sciences and more social science methodologies into biosphere reserves and into the research being conducted in biosphere reserves. And as well as um, local people with new ways of learning and new ways of conducting research. So I think that um, in this context, it wasn't that science wasn't being done, it was that science was being done differently. And maybe I can just give you a couple of examples. So this is one example from Canada, really briefly. About hmm, 10 years ago, I guess, I was approached by the then executive director, who is located on the very top left-hand corner there, of the Canadian Biosphere Reserves Association. And at that time, there were 16 biosphere reserves, we now call them regions, in Canada. And he said, you know, we are such a big country and we have these reserves scattered across such a large geography and the biosphere reserve practitioners are doing excellent work, but they're very isolated and we're divided by multiple time zones. We're divided by geography, physical geography, by culture, by language 
and we're really not learning from one another. How can we enhance the capacity of biosphere regions to, um, through social learning and through networking strategies? And so we took a few years to come together in various groups to enhance the learning around three themes that they had identified as important to them. They were around um, sustainable tourism, land management and ecosystem services, and education for sustainable development. And so over that time, they worked as teams like they had never done before. So not just within their reserve, but really learning from one another. And they created this book and also hosted the Euromab conference for the first time. But at the end of that process, or not at the end, but towards the end, they also started to realize that they were not working very effectively with indigenous peoples on whose territories their designations sat. And so they started a process through the mid-2010s up until the present day to say, how can we learn the history of conservation and indigenous peoples and the way in which conservation practices have marginalized indigenous people? And how can we reach out and work more effectively and meaningfully with indigenous peoples in the territories where we also work? And so, um, to me, we got lots of publications out of that. We got lots of activity. We got lots of changes in governance systems of individual uh, biosphere regions, as well as in the national network. Um, this is a science, but it's a different kind of science, in my opinion. But we also see, I will say in South Africa, there's also work being done by uh, researchers there who are looking at governance systems for sustainability. And Kara Kutzner is organizing a number of researchers and uh, local people to ask questions about how can the governance systems in South Africa, South African biosphere uh, reserves, um, become more effective so that they become agents of transformation? How can biosphere reserves become agents of social and environmental justice? Those are her terms, to advance a more sustainable future. So I think there is science being done, it's just being done very differently than it was in the past. So Martin has kind of outlined some of the you know, challenges of, of the um, you know, project areas and thematic areas and, and coordinated research falling away, but you've kind of also spoken about this you know, emergence of a new and a different way of doing science and the new kind of new flavor of the MAP program. So, so where, where are we now? Where does this leave us yeah. now? Well, I think we're going to continue, and particularly I see with the, new, or with the early career researchers here, we're going to continue with new questions and new kinds of approaches, and I think that's really exciting. Um, there are still some structural issues in place. So within universities, there are still the traditional reward structures for um, faculty who are doing research in um, or from their universities. Some of those are going to have to change as well. Uh, the, the concerns around funding remain. I think that Martin articulated from the 1980s when, and 90s when MAB was no longer the flavor of the day or the decade, right? Those things are also going to have to change. In addition to those that do provide funding, we have to think about what their criteria are for assessing excellence in research. And uh, I think you know, our ideas about what constitutes science, what constitutes knowledge and learning, probably have to change as well. Um, and I will say, I'm not sure. I guess the other thing is that, um, you know, interestingly now, UNESCO, as well as many scientists, some of the people who are in front of you and some of the people in the room, um, are really advocating for biosphere reserves to be considered for their role in the post-2020 framework, um, biodiversity framework, so that they can be recognized, for example, as other effective area-based conservation measures, or OECMs. That may be familiar to some of you. But if this recognition is bestowed, then biosphere reserves internationally will draw greater attention to the network but it can also um, 
result in another layer of compliance that biosphere reserves may have to meet if they're going to be um, recognized as these OECMs. But ultimately, they may get greater recognition as well as the stakeholders and rights holders who work in biosphere regions. But I think that kind of idea fits with one of the recommendations that we made in the book, or a couple of the recommendations. One is to demonstrate the value that biosphere reserves have for national and international priorities. And for those of you who are here last night, I think Pierre was relating, you know, kind of charging biosphere reserves to get relevant, <laughs> right, in a sense, um, at the end of the day. As well as, I think it also means that we need to continue that movement to engage, um, engage with and really support diverse knowledge holders and knowledge systems in a much more, um, in a very good way, I guess is what I would say. So, Great. yeah. Do you have any thoughts, Martin, about uh, what is next? What's next? <laughs> well, what's next, I hope, is that we will get uh, moved towards what is in the Lima Action Plan, which is to have a, not just an international network of biosphere reserves, a world network of biosphere reserves, but an international network of biosphere reserve scientists. And, and I think in scientists we should include other people who, who have knowledge too. And, and that's actually the wording that's in the, in the Lima Action Plan, so knowledge holders and scientists. And uh, we don't have that up there. Uh, but but it, it's in the Lima Action Plan. We are finally moving towards it, and we've still got one or two years of the Lima Action Plan to go. So let's hope that from this meeting we can have that network so we have, again, international collaborative science within the MAB program. It, because it's not that science isn't being done in biosphere reserves. As we've heard yes, last two days, there's plenty of it going on. The challenge is that it's not connected. So there are people doing research on a particular topic that someone else is also probably doing it. Or someone else needs to know the answers or uh, have some ideas from this. Whether it's about nat nat natural sciences, social sciences, interdisciplinary approaches, governance, all sorts of things. So this is really, I guess, my vision, and it's what's in the action plan, to, to really think about, you know, can we go from coming in this meeting as, uh, as individuals to be being part of a network that will, will thrive in the future and reinvigorate the MAB program? And, and of course, just to, to go on one point that... Uh, uh, Maureen says, it does have to be connected to international and national priorities because money is necessary. Uh, we saw that yesterday. Funding came up as the first big thing everyone wanted. Well, yeah, you can't do anything without funding, but you have, and to be relevant, you have to be doing work that is seen as relevant, not just locally, but by, by the nation, national, the, the, the countries you are in, and by the EU, for instance. And I've been successful in getting some money from the EU to do projects on biosphere reserves. It's, biosphere reserves are not in any EU policy documents, but what biosphere reserves can be and what they can be useful for is very much in line with a lot of what's in the EU policy documents. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, I think for, for me, like some of the key kind of learnings that I take away is like, first that, you know, what you were saying, that there is a lot of research happening in biosphere reserves, but that this idea of coordinated research and collaborative research across a world network that can really draw a lot of resources from each other and a lot of sharing and learning isn't quite happening yet. And that I think developing these networks requires a lot of support, a lot of funding, a lot of capacity, right? Uh, but in the long term, right, beyond these kind of short term, two, three year funded projects, right? Because I think you said something before, which is like, you know, that after two or three years, many researchers, they shift. So, so you know, what Maureen was saying about that the systems need to <clears throat> accompany these goals better, right, by long term support and also different kind of incentives, rewarding different kind of outputs, um, which is something that has been brought up in the... Uh, early career discussions as well, you know, how can the, sh the system shift to reward sustainability research, research which is collaborative, which weaves different ways of knowing where the process is also important, right? 
um, which I think has, our, our colleagues will come up and talk about in a moment when they talk about our reflections. And I think the last thing that was for me important that you also said was like that they're really poised right now as a, as a very important resource, right? It's like a network which is existing, which has 50 years of experience and which can implement like national and global priorities, right? And, and so countries can really leverage that capacity and that makes them more sexy, right? <laughs> so <laughs> make biosphere reserves sexy again. <laughs> Um, so I don't know if uh, and any of the... We have maybe a few minutes for questions, maybe one or, one or, two, one or two. Yes. So um, if anyone has questions, this is like an amazing opportunity and resource here. So I don't know if any colleagues have some questions for Maureen or for Martin. Um, raise your hand and I'll come over. Thank you. First of all, a, a comment. I, I think this uh, conversation and, and reflection was extremely useful. Uh, thank you very much for, for that. And uh, maybe in this context also mentioning uh, Martin, I, I guess this uh, all goes back to uh, a suggestion you gave to our colleagues, like that we should have such a conference. And I, I feel like also your concluding words, uh, this is so encouraging and, and stimulating so that, uh, yeah, we, we shall carry on and uh, make biosphere reserves sexy air. Uh, <laughs> and uh, still, uh, the question I, I have relates to science, or let's say academia, which also have evolved since the 1970s with much more pressure related to impact factors and things like that. So there's an own logic. Uh, still, we see, yes, it's possible to have science-related, uh, or at least research done in biosphere reserves, but uh, what is your view on, on, on science and, and the, the current climate and, and landscape in, in, in science, and, and you know, how can this be re better reconnected uh, with MAP? Oh, that's a big question. Uh, I, I think, again, what is important is that MAB is better connected in, in the scientific world. There is Future Earth. There is all sorts of other international science programs. MAB can't just stand on its own and say we want to be special or whatever. It's, so it's not just linking to the um, science, or to the, the priorities, the policy priorities of, of countries and the EU and international organizations. It's also aligning and linking to other international structures. Uh, and, 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 and I think, again, science, this is a problematic word. For, for a lot of people, science still means natural sciences. And, and I think even from the very beginning of the MAB program, social sciences were very much in there. Um, and again, that kind of disappeared to some extent, but it's really coming up. And in this meeting, I think, uh, to social science, uh, even move, including the humanities. We've, we've had here in the room, we have psychologists, we have neuroscientists, we have all sorts of people you wouldn't necessarily expect to have in, in a biosphere reserve related meeting. So I think it's the really interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary side of things is where biosphere reserves uh, need to be moving, not to say ever that the single disciplinary research isn't needed because it is. Uh, but we need, we need the whole range of things, and, and that's a challenge. Uh, it, it does require thinking long term, um, and uh, any of us know who have tried to make interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary projects work uh, effectively and have meaning at the end is that it takes a lot longer to get it going at the beginning, but if you do that, then by the end, it's actually going to um, have, have some value, not just in terms of publications, but value for people uh, and the environment that they live in. Right. Thank you. Um, I think we're maybe are running out of time. I'm getting looks. So. <laughs> so thanks so much to both of you. And if you have questions, you can approach. Working. 
All right, thank you so much for this discussion. Um, very encouraging. Now we would like to, uh, we are very much looking forward to hearing the reports from the first part of the conference. So I'm asking the rapporteurs to come to the front um, already. Actually, in the first days, we had four parallel thematic sessions, one on biodiversity and climate change, one on sustainable societies and economies, one on ecosystem services and one on innovative sustainable and sustainable use of natural resources. And um, we will get short reports, very short reports, very condensed reports from um, uh, each of the rapporteurs for each of these uh, thematic groups. So please, um, the rapporteur for uh, biodiversity and climate change session, Fabio, please come to the front. And maybe the others can also already move to the front. Fabio, please, we're looking forward to your report. Thank you, Eric. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I had the honor to be part of the group focusing on biodiversity and climate change. We had 11 very interesting presentations. Thank you to all the presenters again. And I will try to give you a quick wrap up of, of what we heard in the past two days. Um, we had two presentations um, looking at biosphere reserves in southern Africa addressing heat extremes, climate forecasts, climate adaption and pre uh, prevent prevention of climate change and adaption to it. <laughs> we had, but we had another study focusing on social systems of small-scale fishery in Indonesia and how they are influenced by climate change. Um, we heard about new methods, um, studies that were pretty heavy on the data side, but, but for example, um, how we can use different biodiversity metrics to improve the biodiversity monitoring, or we heard an approach how to use satellite imagery and um, drones to, to monitor a biosphere reserve and to map it, um, which is pretty much inaccessible otherwise. And um, we heard a presentation on how geodata can be used to map ecosystem services in Portuguese uh, biosphere reserves. Um, we also had presentations on wildlife and biosphere reserves. For example, there was a, um, a project, a citizen science project on turtles in Cuba. Um, we heard about non-invasive bat monitoring in a Congolese biosphere reserve. We heard about population trends of forest insects in Germany. Um, and of course, there, were also, there was also research on vegetation. Um, uh, we learned about tree encroachment in wet areas in Rwanda, and um, we heard a very interesting case of uh, an inv invasive plant and how, well, how it can be mapped and how management can be improved to ma um, in a biosphere in Germany. Well, you can, you can hear it's quite, quite, quite a diverse field. Um, we had large-scale studies, we had small case studies, um, we also had a, a variety of researchers uh, presenting their work. We had ecologists, we had an aerospace scientist, we had social scientists and, and data scientists, but many of them took multidisciplinary approaches to their uh, projects and to their questions. Um, we also came across many challenges that researchers face doing their research in biosphere reserves, and also benefits that we think, um, well, how biospheres, uh, biosphere reserves profit from research and how also researchers can profit from, uh, or benefit, that's the better word, um, from, from biosphere reserves and their work in it. Um, let me start with the challenges and end with the benefits, maybe that's more positive. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, one challenge that was often mentioned was the data availability. And even if data is available in the bio, for the biosphere reserve, uh, it seems to be very heterogeneous, especially if you work with many biosphere reserves. Um, I think the, the topic that came up the most was actually administra administrative obstacles and boundaries that researchers face. Um, 
especially research permits. Um, and um, if, you, if you work on a larger scale, you often face the issue of having very different biosphere reserves and trying to cope how to integrate them in one methodolo methodolo methodological approach. Uh, but even if you work on a very local scale with only one biosphere reserve, you sometimes are confronted with still different administrative systems or transboundary um, biosphere reserves. Um, we found that we as researchers often still rely on informal contacts to um, insiders, biosphere reserve insiders. And um, a thing that was also mentioned was that um, we faced trust issues from, from the side of um, biosphere reserves or local communities, probably due to um, prior or previous bad experiences. Um, let me talk about the benefits too. Um, we, we think that biosphere res reserves often benefited from research in that they actually could perform monitoring or gain data on species in their biosphere reserves. Um, they received new ideas or methods for, for, to improve their management. Um, often researchers took the effort to communicate their, their results in, in workshops at the biosphere reserve. And uh, also one, one researcher mentioned that they, um, they think that um, their research actually increased the aware awareness for biosphere reserves in general. And also we as researchers felt that we can benefit from biosphere reserves. Um, I know I mentioned this as a challenge, but it was also a benefit in some cases that there was access to data actually. So many biosphere reserves have data treasures, let's, let me call it this way, um, and uh, we could access a network, a global network of biosphere reserves that helped us to, to, to uh, implement large, larger scale studies. Um, we benefited from partnerships of research institutions and biosphere reserves. Many of these partnerships are very, very old. Um, and um, also, we, I thought that was really nice. We had one study that mentioned that um, it was only possible to identify tree species because they had access to indigenous knowledge. Um, yes, um, thank you very much. That's it from the group for biodiversity and climate change. Thank you, Fabio. And now we would like to hear the short report from the group uh, that was working on sustainable societies and economies. Lena, please. Um, yeah, in the last two days we had the chance to listen to 12 very interesting reports on research projects that were conducted across the globe that were in one way or another focusing on societal structures, recent developments and governance and management issues of biosphere reserves and the man and the biosphere program. Um, we could see a diverse set of approaches and mixes of methods that were actually reflecting the diversity of challenges and problems in biosphere, um, biosphere reserves. Um, and in the course of these presentations, we identified two overarching topics, capabilities and collaboration. Um, now, I'm going to go through the topics um, we discussed very briefly to give you an overview. Um, in the first day, we heard presentations that were dealing with the question, how can management practices and governance structures be better assessed and monitored? We looked at how some biosphere reserves actually monitor their work, their work, and what approaches and processes and data can be used for that. We listened to a study on qualitative governance processes based on the ecosystem governance theory by the IUCN. Then we had a study on monitoring in the tourism sector in this biosphere reserve in Champai de Crin. Also, we discussed how monitoring and management can be improved. And this was the focus of a study on adaptive management in South Africa. 
and we had a study on monitoring in a biosphere reserve in Chile. Then we had inputs on the issue of involvement of local and indigenous communities in the policy and the development of biosphere reserves and the man and the biosphere program. We heard of a designation process and within this stakeholder involvement in a biosphere reserve in Korea. And we took a global perspective on UNESCO's power relations that arguably impede the man in the biosphere program to attain its goal until today. Then the topic of stakeholder engagement and communities as drivers for change was further elaborated and discussed in the second day. A study from Canada gave us insights into the collaboration between different biosphere reserves in Canada. A study from Germany aimed at analyzing and optimizing collaboration between stakeholders, um, aiming at developing an online platform. And we heard a study on social innovations and the role of biosphere reserves as enablers of transition. The final presentations were mainly dealing with local perceptions of cultural landscapes and transformative challenges around social ecological systems. There was a study on different landscape perceptions in Germany, a study on the impact of agricultural transformation on land use in India, and the ecological, social, and economic potential of businesses and business practices like beekeeping in Kenya. Now, listening to all these presentations that gave us insights into various different realities, we could identify several common challenges and benefits that we as researchers in, on, and with biosphere reserves, biosphere reserves face. Of course, this list is far from being exhaustive and can only point to some of the many challenges, like the lack of capacities, that was a major issue that was raised. Also, the concept reality gap, and here bureaucratic obstacles were often uh, mentioned that we have to tackle and overcome. Um, yeah, the lack of communication and difficulties in information exchange is omnipresent. There was a weakness um, in community participation reported by mainly all of us. And also a structural issue is the dominance of the Western-centric perspective in the frameworks of the man in the biosphere program and biosphere reserves. Now, for a positive outlook, let us briefly look at the benefits of doing research in um, biosphere reserves. Biosphere reserves can be, don't have to, but can be, enablers of institutional exchange on different scales and levels. The status of a biosphere reserve can open room for in-depth research into various different social aspects. The frame of the man and the biosphere program and biosphere reserves can make social issues and challenges, inequalities and conflicts visible. Biosphere reserves can be potential platforms that could allow for collaboration and cooperation between various different stakeholder groups. And last but not least, being here and getting to know and exchanging with researchers from all over the world is certainly a benefit. Thank you. Thank you, Lina. And now we would like to ask the next group that was working on ecosystem services, Charlotte and Angela. Yeah, hello, good morning. Can you hear me? Thank you. Yeah, so we were um, looking at the topic of ecosystem services in biosphere reserves uh, from, from different angles. Um, started with uh, yeah, uh, remote sensing uh, research, at GIS, uh, yeah, using other GIS tools um, on a global scale, but also in yeah, uh, uh, yeah, single uh, biosphere reserves, of, of course, uh, looking at ecological effectiveness indicators, uh, but also land use, land cover change. Um, then we had uh, kind of a topical group of um, the, who were rather looking at pollution topics on uh, microplastic um, and, and litter and um, in, in river, soil, lake, uh, continue, con uh, continue, <laughs> sorry. Um, and in, in this uh, group, it, it became obvious because they were yeah, working in, in coastal and marine biosphere reserves. And um, yeah, so 
it became obvious that this topic especially is, yeah, you cannot just look at it at, at the, the biosphere reserve scale, but it's, it's a global topic. And um, there the idea uh, arose that this could be actually something that, that could, yeah, could be picked up by, by the network, um, that we could use the, the marine and uh, coastal biosphere reserve uh, network to yeah, jointly look at this topic and then it even grow. Yes, I mean, this, this is not just, uh, so microplastic is not just a topic in, 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 the, in the seas and um, in the oceans, but it's, we find it everywhere in the soils and um, in, in the, um, yeah, uh, in our bodies everywhere. So that this could even yeah, be picked up by, by the whole network. Uh, and uh, that was the idea of, of a global atlas of plastic. So yeah, just wanna throw this in the room. Um, yeah, then uh, we were also talking, uh, so the, the, the next presentations and uh, that, that, we're, that yeah, we were discussing then also, um, we're rather looking on uh, or using participatory mapping tools uh, where really, yeah, uh, also transdisciplinary uh, approaches, which was really nice, really interesting also to see um, and then discussing, yeah, how to really reach people um, and, yeah, getting them involved in, in, the, in the research. Um, so this was then also, yeah, rather looking on, on or the, the focus shifted rather on looking at, um, cultural and social services, um, and uh, yeah, yeah, and also really interesting. Um, there was uh, also a comparison of um, uh, ecosystem services, especially also then again cultural ecosystem services um, as a comparison between different protected area categories. Yeah, and now I would hand over to Charlotte, who will talk more about the challenges and um, benefits. So, yeah, I just want to point out a few because some have already been mentioned. Um, about, I'm, I'm a geographer, so I'm really much interested in spatial data, and one point that, that was made a lot was data availability and especially geodata, so it would be really crucial to have um, explicit border information of biosphere reserves globally, not only the borders, but also the zoning to do explicit research um, using geoinformation systems. Um, and another challenge that was mentioned was communication, not only between biosphere reserves and researchers, but also between researchers and the local communities. Um, yeah, that could be approved, hopefully. And then, on the other hand, communication or the relationship between the biosphere reserve and the research, researcher was also mentioned as a po positive fact. Um, in one case, in the Ivory Coast, the biosphere reserves manager um, himself um, created or um, gave the idea for the research topic, and then they proceeded together, and the biosphere reserve um, supported the research in logistics and gave information. So, yeah, always benefits and challenges sometimes come together somehow. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. And now the report from our last thematic group, which is innovative and sustainable use of natural resources. Janne, please. So thank you. Hello, everybody. Please, can the people from Group B stand up? Because these are the people that uh, yeah, have made these presentations. And that are the people you can discuss with about everything that I will say now. So now I try to spread the wisdom of this group. First, I will give some key learnings of the group. Innovation may not be what we think it is. Something can be innovative because it was never done in the specific area, or it can be innovative because people are actually asked for their interests. Asking for interests builds trust, and the use of indigenous knowledge systems facilitates a sense of ownership. A sense of ownership and a sense of place can transform communities. 
This bottom-up approaches to what is done by the local people on the ground is mostly disconnected to the top-down planning. However, this mismatch might be integrated by better communication and the ability, your ability, to listen. A big issue of discussion was failure and adaptive management. Failure is the first step to learning, but there's a limited margin to report failures and unexpected results in biosphere reserve evaluations. At the moment, evaluations seem not to lead to change and are not used for decision making, but are only done to show that money is well spent or to justify policies that are already in place. Yesterday, we found a lot of common challenges and experiences. Most of the challenges may be subsumed under the term, please mind the gap. In some sense, that is meant quite literally, as highways may cut biosphere reserves and lead to a lot of roadkill. But there's also a gap between concepts and reality. And as well, you know, and all you know, language is limiting our way of perception and thinking. As an example, innovations may not be detected as they are different from what we expect. Innovations may be very old and useful things that are applied in new ways. The concept of innovation and the innovations on the ground mismatch. The innovation on the ground is not recognized, sometimes not even by the innovators, who find their doings quite normal and therefore don't communicate what they are doing. Also, there's a concept reality gap between reforestation reports and what is actually done in the field. If you look at the research process, first, there sometimes is a tedious pro uh, process to get data or to get permission to collect data. So access to data is a general problem. Second, there's a challenge with how to communicate results of research to political decision makers in an appropriate way for long-term improvement. Also, in some areas, there's the problem to communicate sensitive scientific research without risking the safety and scientific freedom of whistleblowers, especially if there's intense conflict. How to ensure confidentiality, and uh, anonymity and safety of whistleblowers and change makers. And third, is if the knowledge is actually communicated, there's another challenge. Evaluations, which are generally feared by all stakeholders, are not used to change policies, but just to justify them. There is no adaptive management. Again, as we heard, repetition, there's a gap between knowing and doing. Additional challenges, the access to information, and fundamental problems with awareness. Questions that arise often in interviews with local people. What is a biosphere reserve? Where is the biosphere reserve? And what is the biosphere reserve good for? So with that question, we come to potential opportunities and benefits. There are synergies and informal relationships, trust and collaboration, as well as dialogue that may bridge the gap between concepts and reality. Specifically, the ethnographic approach, as well as participatory measures that are open for feedback, are helpful in inducing understanding and minimizing the risk of oversimplification and help people to develop a sense of place. People working in or with biosphere reserves, the staff, knows how the issues are and has a trust and the knowledge that can be obtained and can be used. However, stakeholders may have to lose something, they are not that open. Biosphere Reserve facilitates, uh, facilitates research and also international and interdisciplinary research teams. Additionally, all the research brings awareness for things that otherwise would have been neglected. Also, there's money for reforestation management and sustainable development. While half of the participants did not write any benefits, a big benefit the benefit was the fast production of scientific knowledge that just has to be integrated by you to make a change. Again, there's a gap between knowing and transfer, and time is running out. Finally, to integrate what was said yesterday in the opening ceremony, let's face it. We need a really good metaphor for biosphere reserves to explain it to everybody involved 
and maybe also for us to grasp the severity and possibilities of our work. At the moment, biosphere reserves are just a concept, just a vision. But maybe biosphere reserves are lifeboats. Maybe they are some sort of Noah's Ark. And maybe they will be our only chance to protect the biosphere. Therefore, we need to broaden our perspective. It is not about ego. It is not about polished reports. It is about hope and survival. We need to write history. We have to share knowledge. We need to write and share all the biosphere reserve stories about failure and about unexpected success to learn, adapt, and to increase our chances of survival. Thank you. A very big thank you actually to all rapporteurs because this was their presentations were nothing that they could present or produce before because they had to attend all the sessions obviously and had to report and had to ha had that additional task of preparing the reports um, on top of a tight schedule that we have on this conference anyway. Um, so again, thank you very much to all of the rapporteurs. <laughs> And now we would go one step further before we open the floor to discussion and we will have some time to discuss some of the findings of our early career researchers. Um, after the thematic sessions were completed yesterday, um, we had workshops. So we continued in workshops and we were giving um, different groups questions. And one of the questions was, for example, the international research cooperation among biosphere reserves, among researchers in biosphere reserves. How can we improve it? How can it be improved? So one group was focusing on that. Another group was focusing on the question of how to improve the biosphere reserves concept itself in order to foster research, a question that is related to the issue that we have discussed earlier today already. So I would like to ask, um, and, and well, and um, after, the long day of uh, the sessions and after the workshop, we had to find volunteers who were willing to actually present the results, the preliminary results of their group discussions. And we were successful in finding volunteers. I'm very thankful for that. Um, so um, now this is the, uh, let's say the, the, the results, the, the pack of the results. Um, we will not, of course, be able to discuss all of that now, and there's no need to do that. I'm just asking the, um, the persons from, from, from the groups to present their key findings very briefly to the group, and then we can open the floor to, um, well, to, to questions. Um, who would like to start? Which of your groups? You would like to start? Okay, great. Um, please take the floor. Um, this group discussed the um, um, improving international research, uh, research cooperations. And um, yeah, just take, your, just take your poster to the front and take a phone. Amma, you don't need it? Okay, then you do it like this. <laughs> Great. To start, to start that, um, we, uh, we discussed about past experience in uh, involving ourselves in the, you know, in the international research cooperation. And then we found out that uh, it, it, we, 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 um, we often seen that, um, for instance, um, source of fundings uh, were often accessed only by the Western science and not, only, uh, not for the science, uh, scientists from the rest of the world. Uh, which we also understood because, uh, you know, uh, language still uh, become the uh, barriers for us to, to, to understand each other, to develop our trust. But, and, then, and then also we noticed that uh, gaps in terms of expertises, ideas, knowledge, technologies uh, did exist, do exist until right now. So in order to, you know, to uh, move from the past experience to the vision, to the future, uh, some adjustments and, and are needed. Um, from our group, we um, came to the conclusion that we need better and clearer guidelines as to how to work with um, 
with international researchers and also international aid companies um, sponsoring the research. Um, also to improve the language barriers or to overcome the language barriers, uh, we suggest some um, training and capacity building um, events. Um, and these language barriers are interdisciplinary and intercultural barriers. Um, and then in order to bridge the gap in expertise, we, um, we suggest more skill building conferences and workshops. And now we will move on to the vision. Yes. Uh, in the vision, we thought the most important thing is building trust between the various stakeholders on BIAS. For example, the government, local communities, researchers, and institute, and so on. And so we can involvement, we need involvement of young or early career researchers and more accessible training in workshops and research contribute to local communities and vice versa. So to do the, uh, to, so through this, we believe we can improve international research cooperation on BR. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, right, I think we can just um, use the, the possibility to open the floor if there are questions regarding to what this group has presented. If, if there are questions, then we, are, we would have a moment to, to talk about this. And um, Yes, Maureen, please. Thank you. I have a particular interest. So when you say training and capacity building, what are you envisioning would be effective forms of training? like that and also you know uh, for instance um, uh, donor institution before they decide to allocate uh, you know uh, funding or other kind of resources they can organize training in advance to improve the capacity before the projects are being implemented thank you do we have more questions yes I just wanted to make a comment. Thank you very much for this um, presentation. And what I would add from my perspective is also raising awareness for research to do their research in BIOS reserves and using them really as pilot sites. Because I think there are already also a lot of conferences and international calls, but sometimes it's the researchers that are not aware that they can also do their research in the BIOS reserve and really use them as pilot sites. There were some hands going up, I saw a little. Just a short comment. Um, on the issue of north-south cooperation in research, we have just recently in, at the German Commission for UNESCO looked at what German research funding organizations and research ministries have in place in terms of promoting um, north -south, fair north-south research cooperations. And in all policies, in all guidelines, you have the goal that this should be more just, that there should be a better place for the global south, but in none, not a single strategy or guideline, do you find any mechanism or any proposal how to actually do that. So the goal is understood, but we are still far away on how really to do it from the research policy perspective. Thank you. Thank you and good morning, everyone. Uh, just a comment, uh, I want to build on what uh, Mr. Martin Price said on collaborative and coordinated research programs. I think that if you want to foster the international research cooperation, we have to cooperate on collaborative th research themes, on coordinated uh, themes. And uh, I would like to make a comment because you are going to, uh, starting this year, celebrating the International Day of Bass Reserve each year. It might be one opportunity to define one research program by year. And then people that are doing research may engage in one of those uh, themes 
yearly things, and then we can make an evaluation of this maybe after five years. Or I think that it would be a good opportunity to have corporate research program if you have a, a theme each year on the research uh, for the World uh, International Day of Mass Research. Thank you. I think that's a very inspiring idea, actually. Yes, you are. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have just one question. Did you talk about uh, capacities and uh, what kind of structures would be helpful to, uh, to build up a research network or researcher network for you? So institutional structures or management boards like... Actually, everybody can answer now, right? So everybody who feels, um, who, who feels free to answer, we have, uh, I thank you very much for volunteering to thank present, you. but you are, of course, yeah, not... We leave the question to the rest of the members yes, of the Yes, we will, we will give this question to <laughs> the whole you. room, actually. And we have some hands up. Well, I wanted to <laughs> add this one, uh, actually, my suggestion yesterday. That's why I asked you whether there's a, a time for giving feedback after they uh, present it. So uh, actually, this is just my suggestion, maybe for uh, fostering international collaboration or cooperations. Um, we need to involve uh, well-known uh, scientists so that the donor can uh, uh, deliver or uh, grant uh, some uh, donors to these well-known uh, scientists uh, because trust is very uh, important. And then also uh, can also uh, give you like a transfer technology, how to write good proposals to get the uh, uh, important uh, donors, uh, international donors. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe before we continue with the discussion, I would like to give um, one more group the chance, a representative from one more group to present their results that they came up with in the group, in the group work. And this is Simon. Would you please come to the front? And then we will um, continue with the discussion using the time that we... Uh, it's this one? Yeah, it's this one. It's this one. Okay. Let's take it to the front. All right. Yeah, hello, everybody. Um, my group was dealing with the question, uh, what can we improve uh, yeah, within the concept of biosphere reserves uh, to foster research? And of course, we had a more or less vibrant discussion about our um, yeah, experience made so far in the field during our field work, um, our common visions, and also um, of course, our recommendations for adjustments, but uh, yeah, due to the limited time and the overlap with content from the talk in the morning, I will yeah, reduce uh, my talk a little bit to our major output. And I think we can cluster our results uh, yeah, into two groups. And first, we have the role of the researcher. And second, our second cluster is uh, the interaction of the researcher with the communities, but also with the institutions, the management boards, respectively also the UNESCO. And yeah, if we focus on our first cluster, the role of the researcher, um, we all agreed that uh, yeah, it's time actually to stepping out of the classic role of the researcher. We, critically, we have to critically reflect the knowledge production of the past and um, yeah, we have to integrate pretty much more than in the past local perceptions uh, into our research. So it's again the question how we produce knowledge. And um, another point uh, was uh, very important for us, the transfer of uh, knowledge in a simple way. So it's not just we producing knowledge for the scientific community or for experts from the management board, but also for the people on the ground. And it's quite important um, that we find also yeah, ways of communication to um, yeah, let the people know what we are doing, actually, because we are doing that for the people living in the Spicer Reserve. And on my perfect way, we would produce these results together with the people on the ground. So we are just um, should um, yeah, um, characterize ourselves as uh, yeah, scientists for the communities. And... Um, a next point would be, um, yeah, we have to get to the bottom of the problem. We shouldn't fight just um, yeah, symptoms. So we really, really have to figure out what is the 
root of a specific problem. And of course, this is also bounded to funding reasons, to uh, limited project uh, time durations. So, but there we have to rethink um, so how we can, uh, yeah, dig in deeply into the ground to solve the problems. And of course, um, this is also related uh, to building up yeah, partnership, so we have to create a dialogue with the communities. So this is really important for us. So, and coming to the second cluster, the interactions. Um, yeah, so we agreed that um, yeah, um, management uh, has to be evidence-based and local knowledge-based. So we have uh, yeah, to treat local knowledge, respectively traditional knowledge, uh, with the same importance as um, yeah, our classical research. And yeah, to build up synergies, uh, yeah, we have to combine these two uh, yeah, knowledge clusters. And another important point for us was also um, yeah, open data access, um, the open data access. And of course, we really like the idea that we are a research community. So um, the word uh, family was often used here. Um, I also like this romantic idea, um, and we are all responsible for knowledge exchange, of course, but um, there was also the wish that maybe the UNESCO could uh, overtake an uh, yeah, improved role in data stewardship. So, for example, there's this map provided um, on the web page, so with all these biosphere reserves, but it's not complete. A lot of biosphere reserves are missing, and also um, some biosphere reserves mapped, they are on total different spots, so um, not overlapping with the reality, sometimes 1,000 kilometers away from the actual place. And so it would be very nice if there is, uh, yeah, something like uh, enhanced capacity to, yeah, manage this knowledge. And there's a lot of knowledge about biosphere reserves, of course. And, um, yeah, another point is we have also to reduce the parallelism of management and research, so it should go hand in hand. And um, yeah, this is of course also based on our basic understanding that really we have to serve with our research uh, the locals, the local communities, so we have to understand what are actually the local needs. And um, yeah, so last but not least, so what is also very important for us, um, we should treat the biosphere reserves not just as closed containers. So we should um, use them also as laboratories to find solutions for overarching problems, so on a global scale. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. And thanks again to, to all of your volunteering. It was great. Our workshop session actually ended yesterday, quarter to six. The ceremony started at six, and still you are here today and present the like, pre preliminary results for discussion. That's just great. Thank you to all of you. Big applause. Um, um, we have a couple of minutes to continue with the question session. Um, because I saw some hands up, some issues, some people wanted to address uh, things or would have questions. Mm. Yes, there I see a hand again, yes. Yes, thanks to the groups for, for these interesting contributions and, and in fact all the discussion we've had this morning. Uh, uh, just a couple of points. Uh, the, the, the linkage with the, the global research community uh, particularly in uh, environmental science, might be best done by improved linkage with the International Science Council, which, of course, UNESCO has a close relationship with. Uh, and that, that body represents the peak science councils of most of the uh, world's countries. So it's a kind of parallel, uh, if you like, a non-government system, but UNESCO has always maintained a good and positive relationship with that group. Uh, that's where things like the International Biological Program, the IGBP, Future Earth, etc., are all, all seated. So better communication between uh, the, uh, the, the UNESCO MAB area uh, and the uh, ISC, uh, I think, would be a very good way to, if you like, advertise the potential for, for biosphere reserves. 
And just touching on Nolene's uh, comment about the International Day, I think that's a really good idea um, to have a, a, a regular theme like the World Wetlands Day has a theme every year, um, although that doesn't necessarily tie to research, but a, a theme uh, for the International Day for Biosphere Reserves that is actually also tied to a research theme could be a really effective way of, uh, of advertising. And advertising is actually what everybody is talking about, although they haven't used that word. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we will have to come to an end soon because we want to have a coffee break. I assume that all of you want to have a coffee break. Um, maybe we have time for one or two more questions, if there are. Yes. Thank you. Just a quick comments on the data availability. Um, at UNESCO, MAP Secretariat, we are very cautious of that. And uh, we are now in the process of developing a database for bass reservants of the MAP program. So it's an ongoing work. And Marta, my colleague who joined you today, is in charge of that. So be free to talk to her, to provide her with ideas and also your needs for this database. But uh, we are committed to really have a strong database to be uh, used for the Bass Reserves and Map program. Thank you. Could, could I just make one very small comment, though? Um, a German-led team did a project on ecosystem services from European Biosphere Reserves, uh, which was published last year. It has a full data set of all the boundaries of Biosphere Reserves and their zones, and it's freely available on the web. Uh, I don't have the reference number in my head, but it, it, you can find it. Just look for Ecosystem Services, bias, European Biosphere Reserves in Google uh, Scholar. You will find the, the data set. So if you're working in Europe, it's already there. And, and we are doing it, of course. That we have given the data to them. <laughs> thank you. All right. Um, again, big thank you to, to, to reporting, uh, to all of you, to the rapporteurs and to you, um, uh, to, to the volunteers for reporting the group work. Um, when, when I was following the discussion, they were actually very intense about a variety, a big number of topics that were brought up now. Um, one thing that kept coming up was the visibility of biosphere reserves. Um, and um, because visibility obviously um, brings political weight brings consideration in other political fields. Um, and I think um, uh, Norlin's uh, contribution of opening up this thematic networks a little bit to um, maybe also not just ecosystem-based thematic networks, but maybe process-based thematic networks would be very interesting. We saw in, the, in many presentations topics coming up, obviously, like climate change, um, a, a network on, on Adaptation, mitigation, uh, various could be various aspects of climate change would for sure be very interesting. And what um, strikes me always is that many peripheral biosphere reserves they deal with rural outmigration, um, especially important for when it comes to young people and when it comes to development function of biosphere reserves. Um, so I was wondering whether that whole topic of urbanization, rural outmigration, might be an idea. And I also think that it's great to have this shifting every like to have, um, um, to, to have a theme for each year maybe, or to have thematic networks, as you were mentioning, for a couple of years, while, as long as they are needed, um, and then to shift again. Um, might be a great way to raise awareness among researchers um, to actually come to biosphere reserves, do their research in biosphere reserves. Now, I would like you to continue our exchange in the coffee break. We will have a coffee break now. After the coffee break, we will meet again here at 11 o'clock. We will meet here at 11 o'clock, and then um, we will welcome Dr. Martin Flade, who is the head of Biosphere Reserve Schorfeide Corin, so the director of the Biosphere Reserve that we are in here. He will give a presentation, an introduction to the Biosphere Reserve, because then, directly after that, we will start with the excursion. So we will, um, you are all grouped, so we will have four excursions. I hope that you know which group you are in. If not, there will be a list outside. If you forgot, someone should, uh, has forgot in which group you are, there will be a list. You can check again. You can make sure that you are in the right group. And please, please, 
don't switch the groups now anymore because there are buses and there's a, a given number of seat in each bus, so it's not possible to change the group anymore. I hope that you have prepared a lunch package, um, um, each of you, but I can, could see many people doing that uh, in the morning. And the excursions, very important last point, very important last point. The excursions will start right after uh, our next session. So if your room is a little bit further away, there will be no possibility to go to the room. We will go straight to the buses. So if you need to catch anything, your jacket, uh, some drinks, whatever you need to bring, your camera, you shouldn't forget your camera when you go to the excursion, your shoes, maybe you have the right shoes on. Um, so try to use the coffee break to prepare, to be prepared and come to the next session at 11 o'clock prepared to leave directly to the excursion and now enjoy your coffee break.
Sorry. All right, let us, uh, is it working? Yes, it's working. Um, I really do not want to interrupt your conversations, um, but I will have to for a moment. Um, and you will, you will be able to continue where once we are on the excursion. We are still waiting actually for Martin Flade, who is the head of Biosphere Reserve. He is arriving, he will be there. There he is, Martin. Great to have you. <laughs> Please, uh, please hand it to the technical support at the back. Um, presentation is coming. So, uh, Martin Flade will be introducing the Biosphere Reserve to you in a minute. And while they are still organizing, I use the time for an organizational remark that I want to, um, to tell you. And this is, you are on four excursions. So, you are on four different excursions, um, moving into four different directions. And... Um, on the one hand side, of course, we, the most important thing is we want you to just enjoy the excursion. That's the priority. But we also thought we want to sort of foster the exchange a little bit and the getting to know each other and the sharing of experiences and getting to know people that you do not know so far. So we thought of a little task for you, but it's very easy actually. Don't worry, it's very easy. Um, we have prepared some small cards and on these cards you find the name of the new arrived research manager. So there is one card for each research manager with their names on it. As you enter the bus, as you enter your buses, please, um, there will be a person standing with a um, well, small pile of these cards. Please, now information to all the early career scientists who have been here already for two days. Please take one of these cards, just take one, doesn't matter which one, and then you look at it, and then you find a name on it, and then you find that person. And then the card tells you all the rest. On the card you find, um, please get to know, it's very easy, please get to know each other and exchange your experiences. And what we would be very interested in is if... The early career scientists, we have had our workshop yesterday, we thought so much about how to improve research. If you transfer to the research manager your ideas, the things that you found most important, and talk about that together. And if you are very, very, very motivated, then in your, um, in your presentation, in, your, in, your, in, in this um, uh, sheet that you were given, there, is, um, there are some moderation cards. Write down your key point. One important thing that you find, it could be something that you experienced during the excursion, it could be something that you took out from the discussion, maybe you are, while you are discussing in the field now what, you, what, you, what, you were, what, what we were talking about in the, in the sessions, maybe a new idea comes to your mind, just note it down and give it back to us later, the, these sh small moderation cards. If you don't want to write anything on moderation cards, because you did that, um, very, a lot of that in the work in the last days, that's also fine. You can just enjoy the excursion. Our idea was just 
to you know to to make everybody meet new persons get into contact with new persons and exchange on your experiences because this is what it's all about this is what i want, wanted to mention um before so um don't uh, be surprised when there's someone approaching you as you are entering the bus and asking you to um to pick such a to pick such a small card all the early career scientists take a card and then find that person that would be great. Thank you. And now we are very much looking forward to Martin Flade's presentation. He is the long-standing director of Biosphere Reserve Shorefire de Corin, and he will give us an introduction now to the Biosphere Reserve and actually all the excursions that you are going on are organized by the Biosphere Reserve. So all of you will get to meet staff members from the Biosphere Reserve and you get to exchange with them and share experiences and Martin will give an overview now first and introduce the Biosphere Reserve to us. Martin, please take the floor. Yes, uh, welcome to our Biosphere Reserve. I'm very happy to see you all here. Um, can you please start the presentation? Yes. So I would like to introduce you to the landscape of the Biosphere Reserve. Um, um, and also to our excursions. The excursions will be guided by staff members of the Biosphere Reserve together with scientists and stakeholders working in the Biosphere Reserve. There are almost two or three people guiding the tours. Um, hopefully this works. But before doing so, I would like to show you these pictures of a conference we had uh, in 2018 with more than 40 people from 12 European and African countries. It was a conference on the conservation of a globally threatened bird and fen myers <clears throat> and what i would like to say is that on this conference have been several people from ukraine from russia and from belarus <clears throat> and it was such a good joint work and nobody of them also nobody from russia uh, did want this this war and nobody would like to justify it or to explain or uh, to apologize for it and I very much hope that such cooperation will be possible in soon again at the moment it's not uh, all joint projects are stopped at the moment yeah uh, on this slide you see the federal state of Brandenburg and the Schaufheide Green Biosphere Reserve in the north of Berlin it has one and a half of the area size of the state of Berlin. You can see a system of large protected areas with three biosphere reserves. And yeah, uh, besides Schorfheide Green is Spreewald Biosphere Reserve and Middle Elbe River. Yeah, you are an Ice Age country. Our land landscape was shaped by the glaciers uh, approximately 15,000 years ago. And this glaciers formed a terminal moraine change, chains like here, which goes through the whole biosphere surf. It's only the southeastern part here. And they uh, formed ground moraines with different types of lakes and sanders, uh, very flat areas formed from sand. And you can see the glacier spillway in the south. So um, when our biosphere reserve was established. The main reason was that it is an outstanding example of young moraine landscapes south of the Baltic Sea. So this landscape formation is very important also to understand the, the habitat types and landscape types. And here you can see this nice photo from Eric. And there you can see in the background the terminal moraine of Corin and a very shallow lake and a came. It's a steep hill formed by sediments after the glaciers melted. Yeah. What's also characteristic for our area is the contrast to Berlin. You have 
more than 4,100 inhabitants per square kilometer in Berlin, 22 inhabitants in our biosphere reserve, and there's only 45 minutes by train from Berlin main train station to Korean train station. So it's a very unique situation, and it has to do with the special situation of Berlin before the wall came down, because the western part of Berlin was enhanced by, by the wall, and the eastern part, part was treated in a special way. And so this relationship between this urban area and this rural side is uh, very important for the tourism, but also for marketing of organic products and many other things. So uh, the Biosphere Reserve was established in 1990 as part of the National Park Program of East Germany. It was the last decision of the last government of East Germany before the unification. And it has 1,300 square kilometers. Half of it is forest. Uh, then 39% is farmland and a lot of lakes and mires. And one unique selling point is that it is the biggest organic farming area, continuous organic farming area in Germany with 64% of organic crops and extensive grassland at the moment. Of course, we have a zonation uh, with uh, 4,000 hectares of core zones and buffer zones and transition zone. And the largest uh, core zone is the Gromsin Forest, which is also a World Heritage Site uh, since 2011. I will talk a little bit about later. Very important is the history of this landscape. The Schorfheide forest area was always governmental hunting area since 700 years. So it was also the hunting area of the Kaisers. It was the hunting area of the Nazis. See Hermann Göring here together with Mussolini. It was a hunting area of the East German government with Erich Honecker and Brezhnev was there for hunting, and Khrushchev, and Franz Josef Strauss, and so on. And that caused some problems for the landscape. You can all see it in a wonderful museum, Hunting in Power. Uh, and this ended suddenly in 1989, when the wall came down and before the unification. And today, the regulation of wild animal populations has to be performed in accordance with the Biosphere Reserve Administration. So it's a completely turnaround of the whole, uh, how to say, uh, power, power system uh, up to 1989. So maybe from an international view, uh, the the most variable habitat type in the Biosphere Reserve are the lowland beach forests because they are uh, uh, mostly destroyed in the lowlands. Uh, this is a typical commercial forest used for timber. And this is a view into the Grumsin Forest World Heritage Site. It's part of a, the a site, old growth and primeval beach forest of the Carpathians and other regions of Europe containing 94 uh, properties. Uh, and it's unique in the World Heritage Program of UNESCO. So many sites, sub-sites forming one joint World Heritage. And this is a characteristic view on this forest area. Um, you can see the characteristic uh, aspect is the change, the, the mosaic of old beach forest and a big number of wetlands, mires and lakes. But nature beach forest, old, really old coach beach forest, look completely different. Um, as you can see here by this core zone Fowler Ort, which was actually too small to, became, uh, to become part of the world heritage. Uh, these are some views of this core zone, so it has nothing to do with this 
commercial beach forests, which, which are still rather natural, I have to say. So a uh, completely different thing are the vast pine plantations of the Shawfite Sander. Uh, most of them planted after the Second World War. Those are uh, uniform, homogeneous uh, yeah, plantations, artificial plantations, which have to be transformed step by step into mixed and deciduous forest. And here you can see the, the dark green are the old deciduous forest, beech forest mainly. Brown color are the pine plantations, and the light green are the transformation stands, which are on the way from pine plantations to, uh, to deciduous forest. It's one third each. Ah, yeah. Uh, at the moment, we are here at the Verbelin Lake. So, uh, because of this history, of this hunting history, uh, large parts of the, the forests of the Biosphere Reserve are state-owned, nearly 70%, and then we have national and communal forests, and only 20% are private forests. And this is a very good precondition to try to develop sustainable methods of forestry use, and we have a consent decree, so we have to, to uh, achieve a consent with the State Forest Administration for our management plans, but the State Forest Administration has to uh, make a consent also about the forestry management plan, so we have to work together, and luckily this worked very well. It could also turn out bad in other areas maybe, but not in ours. So, we had two big research projects on nature conservation in such beach forests to set up nature conservation standards for the management of such beach forests and to evaluate uh, conservation-oriented management. And this resulted also in the best practice handbook, Nature Conservation in Beach Forests Used for Timber, uh, published in 2015, and the English edition is just, uh, was just pressed, it's now here. Um, this is the excursion number three, Ancient Beach Forest. We, we will explain all these projects in more detail to you. Other important aspect of the reserve are the lakes. Uh, like the Verveline Lake you see in front of this property, and especially the Clearwater Lake, the Calcareous Clearwater Lake. An outstanding example is the Lake uh, Parstein, uh, with more than 500 hectares of stonewood meadows, submerged stonewood meadows, and six to eight meters of site depth, and so on. And such lakes have high importance for biodiversity for many taxa. One group uh, are the dragonflies, uh, which have the highest species number in Germany just in our biosphere reserve. And of course, we have uh, um, solar powered research and education boat on this lake, uh, which you will see when you take part in the excursion number four. And there we will also explain an, a research project which is now running on, uh, to, to an identify the threats for such clear water lakes and to pilot measures to manage them in a better way, uh, not only for fishery but also for surrounding land use. And this project will explain to you at the second excursion point. But we have also many, many small ponds, more than 4,000 ponds in the landscape, which are mostly formed uh, by ice blocks, so-called ice blocks, which remained after the glaciation. Uh, these are so-called kettle hole ponds. And uh, these ponds have a very high importance for, 
biodiversity for amphibians, of course, for birds, and also for some extremely rare cara species, stonewort uh, plant species. And for instance, for the European pond turtle, which has a reproductive population in the biosphere reserve. Maybe the most characteristic bird in the whole biosphere reserve is a crane, uh, which has a very high density here, the common crane of uh, 550 pairs. And many of them are breeding in such really small cattle hole ponds in the agri agricultural landscape. So another um, important habitat type are the mires. We have approximately 14,000 hectares of peatlands. Uh, part of them are drained. And you uh, can see some examples uh, with cotton grass on the top and especially uh, several types of forest mires, as you can see at the bottom or on this picture. This is a a core zone, a reserve which is uh, out of use since 1907, since 115 years now, was the first nature reserve in Prussia or in Germany, I, I would say also in Germany, because Drachenfels is another thing. Um, also poor Mayas like this one uh, with sphagnomosses and rich Mayas like this one at the Lake Pashtein area. And one important work of the Biosphere Surf Administration was to restore drain Mayas. And uh, since we were founded, we restored approximately 4,000 hectares of Mayas. You can see the green circles. Uh, and one very important example is the restoration of the Zernitz spring mire of 500 hectares, one of the largest spring mires in northern Germany. And uh, it was a very, um, how to say, challenging project. And just will explain to you um, in the excursion number two. We have also agriculture, as you have seen. Uh, and yeah, I have to explain this picture because it explains a lot. Uh, it's a rye field with corn poppies, you can see, and weeds, um, sagittal plants. Um, the type of agriculture you find in the biosphere reserve and the type of agricultural landscape is completely new. It has no historic forerunner because it's large-scale modern organic farming on the area structures of the collective farms of the socialistic time. So not the small feedlots which were present until the 1950s or 1960s, many small pieces managed in a different way, but the huge structures of the collective farms and then partly transformed into organic farming. Um, here you can see uh, the agricultural land. Uh, the green color are the, is organic farmland and extensive grassland. Brown color is still uh, conventional farming. And we have this uh, regulation in our decree. Agriculture has to be stepwise developed towards organic farming. So it's a target in our decree. And this is a development. And important was the privatization of state estates to organic farmers in the 1990s. And this was due to this sentence in our decree. And you can also see that uh, political decisions on the national level, on the EU level, hamper the local development. Here are some pictures of such farmland and rural villages. Uh, we have a lot of uh, endangered, uh, yeah, um, sagittal plant species, which are really important. But uh, there are quite a lot of target conflicts between this large-scale modern organic farming and 
biodiversity or nature conservation. And these target conflicts have been thoroughly studied and solutions have been developed, tested and implemented. And we have also a best practice handbook on nature conservation and organic farming, uh, printed in three different languages and scientific publications about. And we established a method to elaborate nature conservation plans for particular farms. And now we have such plans for 18 large farms with uh, 13,000 uh, hectares in total, and two more are in work. And there are very targeted measures with a big effect, like this drilling gap on organic rye field or um, margins, uh, unmown margins in lake crops and so on. And uh, as indicator, we start monitor the breeding birds. And you can see breeding birds of insectivorous birds of wetlands and forests uh, in the southeastern biosphere reserve with organic farming since more than 30 years. And the whole biosphere reserve in green and whole Germany in blue. And you can see no big difference in forest and wetland birds. But if you look at farmland birds and birds of rural villages, you see this development in the southeastern biosphere reserve, in the whole biosphere reserve decline and now recovery, and in whole Germany it goes down. So you can see the effects of this other type of agriculture net management in, uh, on the biodiversity. But by the example of the village of Brodovin, with 200 dairy cows and 400 dairy cows, is also uh, work uh, with more than 200 employees in this small village. You can see the employees of the big farm. Yeah, and this is excursion number one, agricultural landscape around Brodovin. You will also find in such landscape many steep hills with steppe grasslands, uh, also formed uh, by the glaciation and this are our, our most beautiful flower meadows, which are also almost lost, uh, also in organic farming. Another topic which I will not talk about uh, further is uh, the support of typical buildings in the regional tradition and the combination with um, climate protection. We have an exhibition about that and a booklet and so on. Uh, tourism is also an important land use. We have two types of tourism which are typical. One is a culture and nature tourism. Uh, for instance, in Korean Monastery, in the summer concerts there. And the other type is the organic farming tourism. Uh, people from Berlin and other large towns who come here to, and want to see how their food is produced and how their vegetables are grown. And in Bodovin, we have a big farm fair in the next weekend with maybe six or 7,000 visitors. Yes, and finally, I also want to mention that we have a regional marketing label, Shaw Fighter Korean, uh, with approximately 85 enterprises of agriculture, food production, tourism, uh, crafts, regional marketing, which, um, yeah, which fulfill uh, rather ambitious criteria, environmental criteria, conservation criteria, and regional marketing criteria. And these are the enterprises which uh, cooperate very closely with our administration. So this is our biosphere reserve in a nutshell. I don't repeat it. And hope to see you again in the biosphere reserve. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Martin, for introducing the Biosphere Reserve to us and um, giving us an idea of, uh, of what we are going to see on the excursions. Um, 
Final, now it's time for like the final organizational remarks before we leave the place here and go to the excursions. You will be back for dinner, so we will be back here for dinner, but not much earlier. So don't forget your lunch bag. Um, don't forget the right excursion clothing, whatever you have chosen. Um, and we will be outside to help you to find the, the to enter the right bus to find where 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 to go. Um, Important is for the group of the lakes excursion, please do not enter a bus because the lake is right here. We will, we will meet outside, we will meet just outside here. Um, I will be with you on that excursion and colleagues from the Biosphere Reserve as well. But as you do not know them yet, please um, look for me. I will be waiting for you outside here and we will walk, we will start um, uh, at, well, be there at 5 to 12 because we will start moving at 12 o'clock um, just from here down to the lake. Then we enter the boat and later we will be on a bus to go to another lake. But first we start walking. So do not enter a bus. All right. Uh, do you have questions or does everybody know where to go more or less? It looks like everybody knows where to go. Everybody uh, has an idea where to go. All right, thank you very much for, um, for discussing and for everything, for participating in that morning session and see you um, at dinner time and have a good day, have fun in your excursions.